Welcome to our webinar this morning, live from Milton Keynes. We'll be talking about optimizing energy efficiency with the latest BAM solutions, even on small sites. We'll be presented by James Graham and Simon Hagen. Just a quick housekeeping. During the webinar, we will be using audio broadcast. The small box in the right hand corner will need to remain open throughout. Want to chat to the host? Click on the speech bubble. This is in the top right hand corner, then in the text box. To use a question, click on the question mark in the right hand corner and open the QA box. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please email marketing at ironserve.com or speak to us directly through the chat box. I'm going to hand over now to Simon Higgins. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Simon Hagen, and I've worked in the energy industry for the last 20 years. For the last six years, I've been working at IMSERV developing monitoring and control solutions to enable our customers to effectively manage their energy consumption. The agenda today is shown on the screen. I will start by going through a quick introduction to BMS systems or building management systems. Um, and look at some of the issues you might uh, come across when using these systems and talk about two of our existing products relating to building management systems. I'll then go to my colleague James Graham who will give you some more information on one of our new control products called Control 10. Many of our customers come to ArmServe initially for, for metering services, but when we start speaking to them about control solutions, we often get asked what a BMS is. So I thought it makes sense to start by answering that question today. Traditional BMS systems are usually installed in medium to large commercial buildings and large retail buildings. The cost of installing these systems is a relatively low proportion of the overall building cost. When considered in isolation, it means it's not cost effective to retrofit these systems to existing buildings. It sits at the centre of the heating, ventilation and air conditioning system. It controls various pieces of plant. There are boilers that provide hot water, which put the heat into the building. There are chillers that provide chilled water that are used to extract the heat out of the building and reduce the temperature. For large sites that have high uh, energy loads, heat loads, combined power schemes are also used, which in addition to generating heat also generate electricity. Pump move the hot and chilled water around the building from the plant room where the hot water might be generated in boilers and the roof where the chilled water is, uh, is created to the building zones and the air handling units that deliver those to the zones in the building. There are fans that move air through the building, bringing fresh air in from outside and removing stale air from inside the building. Engine systems uh, are also linked to the, to the building management system. They are actively a standalone heating and cooling system, but they do benefit from working in harmony with other systems in the building rather than fighting against them. The actuators control the flow of water and air throughout the building. Valves control the flow of hot and chilled water, and dampers control the flow of air. The actuators enable the BMS to direct the hot and chilled water to zones where they're required. You quite get simultaneous heating and cooling demands even in the same building. The BMS has a number of different sensors that it uses to determine what to do with those plant and actuators I mentioned earlier. There are temperature sensors that are located in each zone in the building. There are temperature sensors usually located outside and at various critical points in the ventilation and pipework of the ventilation system. CO2 sensors are usually located in the ventilation system and are used as an indication of the air quality and can also give an indication of occupancy in a building. CO2 sensors are used to provide warnings and alarms that, for example, can give early indications that filters are becoming blocked. 
Body management systems are usually linked to the fire alarm. This enables the BMS to shut down the ventilation system in the event of fire so that it doesn't fan any fires and spread them further. Buildings, the ventilation system can also be used as part of a smoke extract extraction system to aid evacuation. The interface for a BMS system will either be a display mounted on the control panel in a plant room, PC, which is usually located in the energy manager's office. The changes to the occupancy schedule or set points in the BMS can be made. Typical building, a traditional BMS controls equipment that is responsible for about 40% of total energy consumption, that's gas and electricity. So you can appreciate how important a BMS is for how energy efficient a building can be. Building systems have traditionally been limited to heating, venting, ventilation and air conditioning, but they can also be used to control light. Light can easily be controlled using the same occupancy schedules as the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. And energy efficiency light level sensors can also be used to ensure that lighting is only used in areas which have plenty of sunlight where it's required. When the BSO controls the lighting, it can be responsible for about 70% of the total energy consumption of a typical building. So it becomes even more important in any in energy efficiency measures. Relations require that a significant number of submeters installed in new buildings. It's quite common for these also to be connected to the BMS, at least initially. However, most BMS systems are designed to collect and present metering data in a way that makes it easy to do energy management. Server, we often get asked to install a separate data logger in buildings to extract the data from these submeters so that it can be analysed in online data management platforms such as IMS EDV or Energy Data Vision. BMA can also be used for access control and CCTV. Like other things, BMS are increasingly connected to the internet and this makes remote support possible from centralised bureaus. On this slide, I just wanted to, to go on to talk about some of the issues that you may experience uh, when using building management systems. First is, uh, is often there is no consideration given for the life cycle costs of, of BMS systems or, or the heating, ventilation and air conditioning plant. Generally speaking, the more money that is spent on installing energy efficient equipment up front, the more the ongoing work cost will be during the life of the building. In retail stores especially, we've lost far too much focus on reducing the pound per square foot fit-out cost to the detriment of future energy efficiency. Different systems are often set up for comfort rather than energy efficiency, and there are things that can be done in the, in the big system that enable um, energy to be saved. For example, in the summer when it's hot during the day and cooler at night, night back can be used by bringing in air from outside that doesn't need any heating or cooling, typically can be used to reduce the cooling costs early in the daytime. There is also a relationship between maintenance and energy efficiency. A well-maintained heating, ventilation and air conditioning system is much more energy efficient than a poorly maintained the problem is that poor maintenance may not necessarily be detriment to a building's environment and be that obvious what's happening either to the occupants or the building owner. In the background, the energy consumption will be creeping up. Clearly, it sets out to neglect maintenance, but we suspect in our experience of working with, uh, with many companies in this area that they serve a agreements in facilities maintenance contracts are partly to blame. Now, are you completely focused on comfort, that's keeping the number of hot and cold calls to a minimum, don't have any balancing energy targets. Our advice is to customers is to ensure that service level agreements in facilities management contracts have a good balance of comfort and energy efficiency to avoid this happening. For example, air filters aren't replaced or cleaned regularly 
and it makes it harder for the fans to move through them and around the building when they have to work harder, thereby increasing energy consumption. Building use can also have a big impact on energy efficiency. In occupancy schedules, uh, is, is one of the biggest. If you can imagine, uh, if a building was initially uh, created as a, a call centre that was running 24-7, the occupancy schedule would be 24-7, and the heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems would run all day. If that building was later used as an office environment, and it was occupied 9 till 5, Monday to Friday, uh, then if the business isn't updated, the energy cost won't increase, but it will still be a lot higher than it should be. Um, and what we find is that um, training is obviously given in the operation of the BMS user interface when the system's installed, um, but some can be quite difficult to use, they're not intuitive, um, can often get forgotten about. Something seen in our own building here in Milton Keynes, Scorpio, where we have a traditional building management system. Um, where uh, it's, a, it's an open space environment where walls get inserted into the building um, it's important that the consideration is given to set up of the building management system in our building we put a new wall up on one side we had a temperature sensor and on the other side of the wall we had the ventilation duct which meant they were both in, in set zones effectively that the BMS didn't know about and was unable to reach its set point increasing energy consumption. Something else we've seen in our building is new sources of heating and cooling which aren't linked to the building management system means that can, they can fight each other off heating energy. Installation standalone air conditioning cassettes uh, an example. The first survey I wanted to highlight to you today was, uh, was the BMS optimization service. This is how we turn a building management system into a building energy management system. This is provided by a partner and involve a one site visit, test the building management system and uh, all the plant. So all the instant savings can be made at this point uh, by changing what well, simple changes made to the occupancy schedule. Um, the site visit's been complete, a site visit report will be sent to the customer, detailing what changes have been made, uh, potential impact on an energy consumption, and it will also highlight a few more things that may could be done by the customer to improve energy efficiency. For example, if, uh, if there's a faulty CO2 sensor, for example, that it look like the air is saturated, the return air from the inside of the building is saturated with CO2. This is the BMS think that the air needs to be changed and brings in as much fresh air as it can in full ventilation speed and using no recirculation of air. Days like this, when it's cold outside, it means a lot of extra heating is required to bring the outside air up to a comfortable temperature before it's delivered to the building. And of course, this is unnecessary. So the site visit report could highlight small um, fixes that could be done that will generate significant energy savings. I'm sure he has um, a BMS system uh, that is suitable to be row fitted to sites with a, an energy spend of greater than £8,000. Uh, in our experience on the, on the rollouts we've been involved with, mainly in the retail sector, um, systems generate energy savings of up to 30%. Across a rollout of, uh, of a number of stores, the actual savings will vary depending on, on how well the stores are managed. Um, we require a survey to, to deliver those, and the reason we will need a survey at site is just to have a look at how the site's used. Uh, to the staff there and get an understanding of how they use their energy, which helps us gain a better understanding of the savings that could be made. And also the heating ventilation equipment is all different, so the interfaces that we would need to, to install would be different to control those. 
these uh, media mesh uh, solutions come with uh, backed by a full 24-7 support service by HomeServe in the form of a bureau. If any changes are required to be made to the occupant schedules of these uh, sites or used to any set points, uh, then the customer can ring our bureau on a 24-7 basis, let them know about the changes, and then the bureau will implement those on the controllers remotely with no need to go back to site. The bureau can also offer advice on, on to maintenance companies about the state of various pieces of plant and give feedback on things like temperature in, in remote sites as well. Um, but I'll, I'll hand over to my colleague James Graham, who will talk to you about our new solution called Control 10, which is uh, targeted at sites when you spend of less than £8,000. Good morning everyone, my name is James Graham and I am the Product Manager for Control 10. I'm going to give you a, just, I'm just trying to uh, share screens at the moment, there we go, wonders of modern technology. Yeah, I'm going to give you a quick tour of the Control 10 system, we're going to be looking at the software interface. Control 10 is a remotely managed mini build management system as, uh, as Simon said earlier. The system has been designed for smaller buildings, such as retail stores, that have a lower energy spend. The system is comprised of an on-site controller and a cloud-hosted user interface. There can be six inputs and four outputs. This means we can control up to four different pieces of site equipment. Typically, we would expect to take control of lighting, heating, insulation, and air conditioning plants. In order to make big savings on small sites, we use the controller to optimise the operation of site plants. Things that lighting, heating and cooling is only used when it is required. In addition to having physical inputs, which allow for sensors to be wired into the controller, we have a range of wireless sensors. This will increase the speed of installation and it reduces the disruption to the customer site. The controller is also a Modbus master we can use it as a data logger to collect readings from Modbus panel meters. We can use it to interface with air conditioning equipment. Now we a tour around, around the system. So what you can see on the screen here is what we call the system dashboard. The system board gives our support teams information that they need on a day-to-day -day basis. From here, this is, if you think of like a file, Structure. This is effectively the highest level of the tree. So from here we can see all the customers, and then below is all their sites, and the controllers that sit on that site. So we can see my mouse floating around. This is the uncontactable controllers section. So if any controllers should fail to contact the server, then it will blanked up here. So that means the support team can can perform any remedial action that's required. Over to the right, we have a full list of customers. And with that, we have the system information tab. Now, this is um, information relating to the, the Control 10 service system. So, if any of the components were in the likely event of a failure. Um, I know it's not a massive picture, but you can see down here are these little green icons. So if those servers fail, then these icons would glow up red, and again, we can we can take the required action. Down here, at the bottom of the screen, is the alarm notification section. So this is all, the, all of the controllers that are out on site, they can be configured to trigger alarms in, in certain conditions, i.e. if a light switch is on when it shouldn't be, if a alarm is triggered, then the controller will send an alarm signal back to the server to be flagged up here so our support team can take immediate action. Okay, let's move on to the next page. This is the customer dashboard. So again, the, uh, the file structure analysis, this is moving down to the next level in the tree. So this is looking at a customer and all of their sites. So 
at the top of the screen here we have uh, site statistics. <coughs> Excuse me. So this shows you how many customers that you've got with active controllers. And this little red box tells you how many controllers on their site are in alarm. And we have a list of sites. And again, the uncontactable <laughs> the uncontactable controllers section here. So you can see how many controllers a customer has that aren't communicating. Moving over here to the section, this is actually a note section. And what this allows our support team to do is if they get any calls from a customer querying anything or to let us know if they've got maintenance staff in, how you can make notes in here. You can also you can put any required actions in there. So it, it summarizes things. So if, if one person were to put the notes on day, someone's logging in later can look at it and they can they can follow up on it. So this is the site dashboard now. So again, we've moved down another level. So here we have notes that are specific that site. We also have on the right-hand side here, we have the operating hours. So if we look at a retail store, then this might be their opening hours. And this is, this is effectively what governs uh, time chills. actually detail the, the customer's address and contact details, which is obviously always very useful. Um, opening hours, so here if we need to make any changes to their opening hours, again if it's a shop and they, just, they have a change of policy and they decide they're going to open for an extra hour, we can just quite easily go in here, adjust the time, send it to the controller on site and that will be updated. We um, also do actions in operating hours. Now, what this means is that if a store, for instance, they were going to stay behind a bit later to stock up. <coughs> excuse me again. What we can do in here is we can put the date and times they need to be open, which then sends it to the controller. So on that particular day, the store will open for an extra couple of hours and then systems will switch off after that and go back to their normal operating hours the next day or the next days, whatever it may be. Okay, moving on. So the next tab we're going to look at is the communication tab. Um, it's not massive lighting, but I thought I'd show it to you anyway. What we do here is this is where we configure the, the local communications of the controller. So we have Modbus communication, so we can set the board rate for any Modbus devices. We also set the logging interval here, because as I said earlier, control can act as a data logger, and in here we can specify what the time period that we want to log. So we can do 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15, 20, or 30 minutes. Here we have communications. This is for the GPRS modem on the device, so um, like mobile phones and all good things, we need to have certain parameters to allow it to log in and connect, so that's where this is configured. We can see the current IP address of the device, the protocol it's using, and the port number. I think it wasn't uh, simply exciting, but I thought I'd show it to you anyway. Right, so the next level we're going to go to down to is the controller dashboard. So this is the well. From my point of view, being a bit of a, a geek, this is the uh, this is the exciting part. This is where all the magic happens, if you like. So here we can see all of the inputs. So this is inputs down here, and all of the outputs here. So we can we can see what they're called and what they do. Over here, in the output section, we have an override. 
to do is we can switch things on and off manually. So say, for instance, um, a heat engineer comes in to, to look at a door heater, we switch it off and on, he requires to help him test it or just isolate it. Um, when it's in auto, that means it's running to the time schedules that I, I briefed you earlier. Moving over to the right here, this is the logged data. So when I was talking to you about logging intervals, what we can hear is five of the previous logging periods. So depending on what you've chosen, whether it be five minutes, ten minutes, these are cut up into chunks of whatever that figure might be. So we can see what the status of the inputs and outputs was at that time. We can also, this button here, refresh current values. We can click this button and it sends a command to the controller. The controller then uploads its current inputs and outputs, sorry, the status of its inputs and outputs. So let's move forward a bit. Okay, that's what you can, that little go there you can see, but that's actually showing from off to auto. Now, the refresh current values, you can see this little icon here. So that's done, it's sent its request and it's got the data back. And you can see when we turn that from off to auto, the state of this input output is now on. We also have some tabs at the top here, so this is sort of specific, excuse me, specific information regarding the configuration of the controller. So this particular tab is input and output configuration. So this shows you here that one of our outputs is the perimeter lighting of a, of a premises. We see the type output that it is, and then it's got an alarm attached to it. We also have same information over here for input, so we've got a few temperature sensors. You see how they're configured, so it's just useful reference information for our, our team. This is the equipment tab, so if we've got any Modbus equipment set up on site, then we can see its configuration. On this particular site, we've actually got a um, a small panel meter that's recording the kilowatt hours from a, a door heater. Okay, moving on, we have got the control rules. So this is effectively the logic that governs the systems that are controlled on site. So this one here is, is a rule door heaters. So the control mode here is temperature. So what we do is we have a temperature sensor feeding into the controller. The controller is constantly monitoring the temperature and looking for a certain set point. In this case, it's 19 degrees. So when the store, no, it's not. It's 50 degrees. So when the when the outdoor temperature is less than 15 degrees, the door heaters will come on, but it's within the time schedule. Okay, so we can't search. This is quite a, a neat little inbuilt function that you can actually extract data from a controller for analysis. So over here you have the available points. So these are the data points that have been logged by the controller. So what you do is you, you select the points that you're interested in, move it here by dragging it, you show you want to analyze the data. So you can show the raw values, you can see the minimum or maximum value. You can see the count of the, of the ins and outputs. You can look at the average, or in the case of a of measuring, you can you can look at the advance across a period. And also, you can obviously select your, your date and time range. There's also other filters you can apply to it to extract dates that you, you need and dates that you don't need. So what happens is it, it generates a small table of data at the bottom. And you can either look at the screen, or in a moment, yeah, you have a, a, a Microsoft Excel logo here, which allows you to export it into Excel format, which 
which means you can do further assist using the, uh, the charting facilities within that. We're just looking at a, a meter advance now, which is from the Modbus panel meter I spoke about earlier. So we go advance across the period. We go so 206 kilowatt hours. Our next tab is information. This is the, a summary of of everything to do with that controller. So you've got the serial number, the type of controller it is, um, who installed it, the store supervisor's name, the status of the control, whether it's commissioned, decommissioned, or not commuting, the status configuration, the commissioning date, and who commissioned it. It's all quite useful data to keep. Um, from here we can decommission the controller. So if we wanted to set up a different set of control rules, we decommission it, change the control rule setting, and then recommission it. From here, we can also generate an Excel report. So at the time of commissioning, the engineer would generate an Excel report, which would then be filed. So for future reference, we can see that everything was tested and the inputs and outputs were displaying the information that was expected at the time. From here, we can also reconfigure the controller. So what that means is we can change any variables that are set up, so um, set points and time offsets. And what offsets is that we have, um, the way it works is we have our standard operating hours on site. And for instance, if we have lighting, what we would say is if the store or site opened at nine o'clock, if they wanted to be in at half past eight to, to start stocking up or what have you, then we would have perhaps a, a minus 30 offset. So at half past eight, the lights would come on. And at the end of the day, we would do a similar thing. So if they planned to stay on half an hour later after hours of trade, then you would give them a positive 30 minute offset, which would give them an extra half an hour. Then back to, uh, to reconfiguring, so there's certain, as I say, variables. So here we have the, the offset uh, temperature set point, so we can reconfigure that. Overrides the scaling of inputs and outputs. So it's quite useful sometimes when things change on site. Uh, now here is our controller management page. So this is a kind of high level view of all of the controllers and serial numbers that we have. Um, out. In fact, in total, whether they're out on site or sat in a warehouse, it's quite a useful asset tracking tool that we've devised ourselves more than anything else. Well, I hope that was okay. And I, um, I, I, I apologise that the, the picture wasn't great. I had some, some issues uh, with my computer. Um, we're going to have a, a bit of a Q&A session now, and hopefully we'll be able to answer all your questions. And if we can't, then we'll certainly come back to you afterwards. Okay, um, we've got quite a few questions that have come through. Again, apologies for the, the screen. We had a few technical issues with WebEx to get that, that little bit clearer that we would have liked. Uh, I think this one's for you, Simon. Um, how much does Control 10 cost? Um, well, it varies. Uh, unfortunately, I can't, um, can't give you uh, one answer. All buildings are different. Um, so that's really one of the big things that we carry out a survey for is so that we can give the, the customer a firm price. Brilliant. Um, for you, I think this was for you, James. How much does um, how much ROI would we get from Control 10 in a typical 12-month period? Um, it, it depends on on the on the scope of the of the site and, and how much we're controlling as to the the actual investment of the system. But from what we've seen so far in the customer trial. Looking at anything between 12 and 18 months, which I think is quite an aggressive payback period. Right, that's great. Um, Simon, um, how do you control air conditioning? Um, there's, a, there's a number of ways of, of, of doing that. Um, at the simplest, it's there are a, a 
adapters you can implement, not just uh, disable air conditioning, which is a very simple and effective way of, of making sure air conditioning is switched off overnight. Um, air conditioning quite often gets left on, um, like with lighting, you know, when you when you leave a building, you turn back and look at it, if it's lit up like a Christmas tree, that's a fairly good indication that you've left the lights on. But if you leave the air conditioning on, uh, quite often it sits there in, in a standby mode when it's not required. Um, don't see or hear anything, so it's very easy to, to leave it on. So the simple level uh, we can deploy interfaces like that, and they're very cost effective. If if overnight consumption was the was a problem on a particular site, um, as you as you move up the sort of complexity, if you like, really the cost of the interface goes up. Um, but it does give you a lot more information. We can deploy Modbus interfaces, which will give us access to all the information in the air conditioning system, like uh, set points, the fan speeds, um, whether particular air conditioning units are on or off. Um, uh, on those, we can, in addition to making sure the air conditioning system goes off overnight, we can also make sure that uh, sensible set points are being used to reduce the energy consumption during the day. So unfortunately, it's another, it depends, but that's why the, the, say, the survey report is, is so important. And coming to the survey um, issue, um, somebody has asked, is a survey always necessary, Simon? Uh, yeah, you know, we've, uh, we're flexible in our approach to these things, um, and we, we do as much as we can up front. So we, the Bureau team will quite often um, phone up the, the site, which is a bit different from the customer, because they're normally in a in head office, and we'll ask them basic questions to do with... Um, uh, what equipment have you got? And quite often we'll, we'll, we'll have to, if the site's got air conditioning. The problem is that we need to go down to model numbers, um, which are quite often on nameplates inside the air conditioning system, and most ordinary users of a building are unwilling, quite understandably, to to look at that. So, so yes, um, we've tried not doing a survey before, uh, and it's resulted in a much higher abort rate when it comes to installation work. So it is unfortunately a necessary evil which which usually ends up with a much better outcome overall. Okay, great thank you for that answer. Um one for you I think now James. Um how long does an installation take? <coughs> yeah, I think uh, it's a really good question. We're very conscious that obviously in experience uh, a lot of the places that we've we've put control tenant again going back to retail where they have tenants to be retail, we're very conscious obviously that we don't want to disrupt site operation. Uh, the beauty of, of Control 10 is that it's a small and, and simplified control system, which means we can, we can well, I'm just trying to think of an instance where we haven't. Every time we've installed it, it's been done in an evening. Again, it's on the scope, but yeah, from experience, an evening is sufficient. Excellent. Um, one to you, I think, Simon. Yeah. Is there a cost to the survey, and is it offset if you purchase the system? Uh, I get a flexible approach. I think initially we'll have a conversation with a customer, and we will um, we will have a big potential opportunity is, um, and uh, there is a cost to any survey. Um, uh, but yes, if if it depends on the, the number of the surveys, the nature of them, how big the buildings are, um, and how dense they are. If there's a lot to be done in one area, obviously we can get through them a, a lot quicker. Um, and yes, that will be offset if, uh, if, a, if a system's purchased. Brilliant. Um, I think this is one probably for you again, Simon. Sorry about right. that. Right, yep, that's okay. Um, what, Shoot. What type of typical things would um, save the most energy that you've controlled? Um, well, in, uh, in all the projects we've run, it comes down to the comes down to the to the same things: um, lighting and heating and cooling are the are the biggest things. Um, and quite often, uh, they will fight each other to a certain extent. In some of the um, fashion retailers that we, that we've worked with, they've got some very high-powered lights um, that are used uh, to light up their merchandise. Um, but they're of the type which also generate a lot of heat. So the more you've got, the more air conditioning you need. So lighting is, is, is certainly one we, we look at controlling. Um, we will control um, sign lighting, window lighting, based on, on lux temperature or light levels outside. 
Um, and as James has alluded to, the actual uh, retail lighting is quite important as well because people spend a lot of time in retail buildings when they're actually trading. Um, and quite often there's one light switch which illuminates the whole um, sales area. So one of the things we try and do is, is split that. Uh, I we talked about it earlier in the webinar where we provide some background level of lighting so that staff can uh, can put out their merchandise, they can clean, they work on the shop floor safely, but they don't need the sort of light levels they need to trade. So we'll bring lights on uh, when the staff arrive, five minutes before they trade, the full lighting will come on, and then five minutes after they finish trading, the full lighting will go off and back to the background until people leave the building. Uh, another sort of uh, enemy of, of any efficiency in, in retail is uh, something we seem to have with open door policies in the UK. Um, we have such a cold climate like we've got at the moment, um, those door heaters, uh, their energy consumption can be can be massive, um, blowing blowing hot air across the door. So door heaters are another thing which we try and, try and take control of. Um, back of house lighting um, is quite often fluorescent, which is quite energy efficient anyway. But if there's a lot of that, then we can take control of that as well as Back of house heating and cooling as well. Okay, brilliant. One for you, James. Um, can sites change set points slash operating times, etc., themselves, or does it have to be done through the support service? No, I mean, given Control 10 is designed to save energy, I would suggest it's better off being managed as a global policy. Set so set points. Obviously, operating hours do tend to change site to site. But certainly set points is something that you need to look at your data and analyse the, the performance of the plant on site versus the comfort on site and try and keep that as something that is globally managed. If you start having people on site to, to change set points to, to any, any parameter they choose, then you're going to end up losing any, any benefit of having the system there. Okay, great. One for you, then. How do yep. your loggers obtain data from the BN? Um, I think I'm a broken old record going on here. It sort of depends um, how the site's set up. Again, why a survey is so important. But generally speaking, we've got uh, a number of ways uh, of, of doing that. Um, we've got some, some systems that um, will interface to the BMS uh, automatically. But those systems are relatively expensive to set up, so you need a very, very big BMS system to justify it and bring data back from a lot of meters. Um, and a simpler approach is, is just to disconnect the meters from the BMS system if they're not being used as some sort of maintenance tool. So if they're um, modern Modbus meters, then we use a Modbus uh, GPRS data logger to connect them, which is normally installed next to the BMS panel, so the Modbus connection can be removed from the Modbus panel and put into, into the data logger. Um, capable of taking pulses from uh, meters as well. You know, things like water meters are electronic, so they're always uh, pulse enabled. Um, and we can also collect data from M bus heat meters uh, using, a, using a similar approach. Okay, great. One for you, James. Um, are there any grant um, funds available that you're aware of which may assist in installation costs? It's a real question, and it's a, it's a very topical question at the moment as well. Um, the short answer is to no. Um, at the moment, we're currently going through the process of getting ECA approval, so that's the enhanced capital allowance for um, Control 10. We've actually had some more functionality into the system, so it's taken us slightly longer because we've had to effectively start again. But um, in, in the process, so it, it's a case of watch this space. But yes, that is coming. Okay, great. Hello, for you, Simon. Can both systems control biomass boilers as well as traditional gas boilers? Uh, yes, we've, we've seen an uh, increased number of uh, biomass boilers out there. Um, their own sort of local control system is, is, is obviously more complex and quite different from a gas fired boiler in terms of you've got hoppers uh, and conveyors and all sorts of things to deliver the. the, uh, the the fuel to the boilers, um, but from a from a control point of view, um, quite often the interface system are exactly the same as a traditional gas boiler. There's a, a contact they use uh, to to tell the boiler that you want some demand, you want some heat, and some 
something to ten volt analog signals to tell it exactly what um, set point to drive to. So, so in short, yes. No okay, problem. brilliant. I think this is probably the last question we've got through today. Um, generally, how much energy can Control 10 save in your experience so far? Again? Uh, again, great question. Um, we've got, at the moment, the, the, the that we're working with at the moment, it, they're quite varied. Um, some sites we're, we're just controlling air conditioning, other sites we're controlling lighting, air conditioning, um, air handling units. So it's a bit of a mixed bag, but I would be lying if I said we'd seen up to 30%. As I say, it's very, very varied. Some of them are, you know, 18%, some are 16%. So, yeah, it's a mixed bag. Yeah, it's all very positive, and we're very pleased with it. Great. Um, that was the last one. Just got another one through. Um, is Logger's energy management software web-enabled, and can it send exception reports? Very good uh, question. Um, in short, yes. Um, the the loggers we use always send data back to to our sort of data cloud, if you like, um, and we present um, energy management information to customers in EDV, Energy Data Vision. Um, and when we're looking at monitoring solutions, that data comes back in in real time. Uh, so every every time a half an hour. Uh, by within sort of five or ten minutes, the data for that half an hour will be delivered to, to us and be put into Energy Data Vision. And the can be set up in EDV to send emails to customers. A lot of customers like uh, they set a profile up for a, for a site based on expected energy consumption. So they'll have a, a really low level at night, and then they'll have a, a relatively high level during the day. And if any energy consumption goes above that, then, then EDV can be sent to send an email to someone to say, you know, energy consumption is, is, is not what you expected it to be. Go, go and look at something and give us some change to, to get the energy consumption back under control. Right, um, we've just had another one through. You know, please keep them coming. We'll answer as many as we can. Can training be provided to sites on how to use the system, James? Absolutely. All, again, going back to what I said earlier about set points, we would recommend that you nominate someone to manage the system. I, I would just severely discourage individual sites from being able to, to control the system. Again, all energy management policy should be in place and it should be enforced with Control 10. Okay, brilliant. I think that's, that's it for today. If anybody has any other questions, please send them through to marketing at ironserve.com and our experts on the panel today, Simon and James, um, will be able to get back to you on those. Um, back over to you. Okay, well that's, that's great. Last slide to Simon again. I'd just like to, to thank everyone for joining us. Hopefully everyone got something out of today's uh, event. Um, as I said, if you've got any questions that you didn't get a chance to ask today, then uh, email them in and we'll do our best to get back to you. Um, and keep an eye on the, the IMSERV website, www.imserv.com, uh, to look for future webinars and podcasts in this series. Thanks much for joining us. Goodbye.